Okay, so thank you everyone for coming. Um, today is Yom HaShoah or Holocaust Remembrance Day. Um, and ONR decided to participate in a new initiative and task force called Zikaron Basalon, which is about learning about the Holocaust and stories of survivors from your own home. Um, which is really awesome. So we're really excited to bring this to you. So before we do anything else, oh, here's Ethan. Hi everyone, sorry I'm late. So I have the Shoah candle, which was lit, lit in, lighted last night. Um, and there's a prayer that we're supposed to say. So I'm gonna say it for all of us. So, um, let me find it. Okay. Let the glory, glory of God be extolled. Let your great name be hallowed in the world whose creation you willed. May your sovereign rule soon prevail in our own day, our own lives, and the life of all of Israel. And let us say, Amen. Let your name of the Holy Blessed One be glorified, exalted, and honored, although you are beyond the praises, songs, and adorations that we can utter and let us say amen. For us and for the, all of Israel and for those who perished in the Holocaust, may the blessing of peace and the promise of life come true, and let us say amen. Okay. Um, so I'm gonna turn it over to Ethan to explain what we're gonna do next. All right, next we're gonna watch a video from a Holocaust survivor who survived uh, the infamous twins experiments in Auschwitz. She's a Holocaust survivor named Eva Kor, and sadly she passed away this year. So it's really appropriate that we're watching it on the first Yom HaShoah that uh, she can't be with us. Yeah, we were unable to get a real survivor, but her story is really, really incredible. So we want to share it with all of you. Right, it's very impactful. Yeah. Um, so Rebecca's going to share her screen. Hey, Rebecca, we have no sound. Rebecca, can you just share your audio with it as well? <clears throat> I'm going to figure who? <laughs> Can you share both sound and video? No, just unshare your sound and play the video. You should be fine. Can you hear this? I was born in 1974, yes, yes. one of a pair of twins. And Miriam and I were the third and fourth children in the family. We lived in a very small village in Transylvania, Romania. Rebecca, you, you can't mute yourself. We got down from the cattle car. People were selected to live or to die. People crying, pushing, shoving, dogs barking, trying to make some sense of that place. And I actually turned around in trying to figure out what is that place. Never seen a place like that before. And as I turned around, I realized that my father and my two older sisters were gone. Never saw them again. We were holding on to mother for dear life. And Nazi was running in the middle of that selection platform, yelling in German, twins, twins. He noticed us and demanded to know if we were twins. And my mother asked, is that good? And the Nazi said, yes. My mother said, yes. At that moment, another Nazi came, pulled my mother to the right. We were pulled to the left. We were crying, she was crying. 
and all I ever remember is seeing my mother's arms stretched out in despair as she was pulled away. I never even said goodbye to her, but I did not understand that this would be the last time that we would see her. And all that took 30 minutes from the time we got down from the cattle car and my whole family was gone. Only Miriam and I were left holding hands and crying. We were mangled twins, which we found out later on what that meant. Mangala would count us every morning and he wanted to know how many guinea pigs he had this day. I was used in two types of experiments. Monday, Wednesday, Friday, they would put me naked in a room with my twin sister and many other twins up to eight hours a day. They would measure every part of my body, compare it to my twin sister, and then compare it to chart. On alternate days, Tuesday, Thursday, Saturday, they would take us to a blood lab. They would tie both of my arms to restrict the blood flow, take a lot of blood from my left arm, and give me a minimum of five injections in the right arm. The content of those injections, we didn't know then, nor do we know today. After one of those injections, I became very ill with a very high fever. My legs and arms were swollen and very painful. I was trembling as the August sun was burning my skin and I had huge red spots covering my body. The next visit to the blood lab, they didn't tie my arms. Instead of that, I measured my fever. And I was immediately taken to the hospital. The hospital was another barrack, but it was filled with people who looked to me more dead than alive. Next morning, Mangala came in with four other doctors, never ever examined me, he looked at my fever chart, and then he declared, too bad, she's so young. She has only two weeks to live. For the following two weeks, I have only one clear memory, crawling on the barrack floor because I no longer could walk and crawling to reach a faucet with water at the other end of the barrack. And as I was crawling, I would fade out in and out of consciousness, telling myself I must survive, I must survive. After two weeks, my fever broke I felt immediately a lot stronger. It took me another three weeks for my fever chart showed normal. Miriam, when I got back, she was sitting on the bed, staring into space. When I asked her what happened to you, she said, I cannot talk about it. I will not talk about it. And we didn't talk about Auschwitz until 1985. And I asked her in 85, Miriam, do you remember? And I was taken to the hospital. She said, yes. I said, what happened to you while I was in the hospital? She said, I was under Nazi doctor supervision 24 hours a day. It was the same two weeks that Mangala said I would die. So I said to her, what happened to you after the two weeks were up? She said she was taken back to the labs, injected with many injections that made her feel very sick. As we found out years later, when she grew up, got married in Israel, expected her first child, she developed severe kidney infections that did not respond to any antibiotic. Second pregnancy in 63, the infection got so bad that the Israeli doctor studied her and they found out that Miriam's kidneys 
never grew larger than the size of a 10-year-old child. So I begged Miriam that not to have any more children because every pregnancy was a life crisis. But she had a third child, and after the third child was born, her kidneys deteriorated, started to deteriorate. And by 1987, they failed, at which time I donated my left kidney. I had two kidneys and one sister, so it was an easy choice. But a year later, she asking me to find Walsh files. Files, we never found out what was injected into our bodies. Miriam died June 6, 1993. Months after Miriam died, I received a telephone call from a professor at Boston who said he heard me speak and he would like me to go to Boston and speak. And when I came there, it would be nice if I could bring a Nazi doctor. I was stunned at such a question. And when I thought about it, I remembered that the last project that Miriam and I worked together before she died was 1992. And was a documentary done by a German television about the Mengele twins. And in that documentary, there was a Nazi doctor from Auschwitz. And I figured if he was alive, in 92, he might be alive in 93. So I got his telephone number, I called him and invited him to Boston. Then he told me he was not willing to go to Boston, but he was willing to meet with me at his house in Germany. And I didn't, didn't plan to ask him any of these questions. Suddenly, I am asking him, you were in Auschwitz. Did you ever walk by a gas chamber? Did you ever go inside the gas chamber? Do you know how the gas chamber operated? He said, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. He said, this is the nightmare that I live with every single day of my life. And when I'm describing the operation of the gas chamber, he was stationed outside, looking through a peephole, while the gas was coming down and people were dying. When everybody was dead and nobody moved, he knew that they were dead and he signed one death certificate. No names, just the number of people that were murdered. And I asked him to go with me to Auschwitz in 1995. Then we would observe 50 years of the liberation of the camp. Because I wanted him to sign a document, just what he told me, but I wanted it signed at the ruins of the gas chamber in Auschwitz. And he agreed immediately. I will have an original document signed by a Nazi. And if I ever met a revisionist who said the Holocaust didn't happen, I could take that document and shove it in their face. I wanted to thank this Nazi doctor for his willingness to document the gas chamber operation. I didn't know how to thank the Nazi. I didn't tell anybody about it because even to me it sounded strange. I didn't want anybody to change my mind. After 10 months, one morning I woke up. The following simple idea popped into my head. How about a letter of forgiveness from me to Dr. Munch? I knew immediately that he would like it and that was a meaningful gift. A Auschwitz survivor gives him a letter of forgiveness to a Nazi doctor. But what I discovered for myself was life changing. I discovered that I had the power to forgive. No one could give me that power, no one could take it away. It was all mine to use in any way I wished. And that became an interesting thing because as a Victim of almost 50 years, I never thought that I had any power over my life. 
Now I began writing a letter and I didn't know how to write a letter of forgiveness. And it took me four months to write it. And then I thought somebody might read it. And I, I, my diction in English is good. My spelling is not. So I wanted my former English professor to correct my spelling. So I called her. We met three times. And third time she said to me, now Eva, very nice. You forgive this Dr. Munch. Your problem is not with Dr. Munch. Your problem is with Dr. Mengele. I was not quite ready to forgive Mengele. She said to me, okay, I have been meeting with you, correcting your letter. Now I want you to do me a favor. When you go home tonight, pretend that Mengele is in the room and you are telling him that you forgive him. But I want to find out how would it make you feel if you could do that? Interesting idea, I thought. And when I got home, actually, I did something else. I picked up a dictionary and wrote down 20 nasty words, which I read clear and loud to that make-believe mangle in the room. And at the end, I said, in spite of all that, I forgive you. <laughs> Made me feel very good that I, the little guinea pig of 50 years, even had the power over the angel of death of Auschwitz. So that is the way we arrived in Auschwitz. Dr. Munch came with his son, daughter, and granddaughter. I took my son and my daughter. I read my declaration of amnesty, which is a very good document. And uh, I signed it. Dr. Munch signed his document. I felt free, free from Auschwitz, free from Mengele. So now that I have forgiven him, I knew that most of the survivors denounced me and they denounce me today also. But what is my forgiveness? I like it. It is an act of self-healing, self-liberation, self-empowerment. All victims, all hurt, feel hopeless, feel helpless, feel powerless. I want everybody to remember that we cannot change what happened. That is the tragic part. But we can change how we relate to it. Okay. So first of all, I think her story is incredible. I think that she in and of herself is a very like courageous and brave woman. And after what she was able to do after being so hurt 50 years ago and being able to forgive who hurt her, I think it's very, very powerful. So we're going to have a little discussion about that video and about anti-semitism today um and we would love you guys to participate so um our first question is seeing how brave she was would you be able to forgive the doctors of the holocaust if you had lived during the time why or why not you guys can like all unmute yourself and it can be like an open discussion too I think that's a genuinely tough question to answer since the Holocaust was so formative in um, in all of our collective Jewish identities. We can't, we can't imagine ourselves being like, I guess, in the Holocaust. So if we were even to really think about forgiving, I don't think a lot of us could really conceptualize that because some would say, oh yeah, we can forgive, but six million and maybe more could have potentially died. And five million other people who weren't Jews died. Like, I'm not sure if you could necessarily forgive that, but also you can't also say, 
I won't forgive because that's just kind of, I guess that's an unhealthy burden to bear. So it's just a really, really tough question. No one can really answer that conclusively with a yes or no. There, it's kind of like a Venn diagram type thing, I guess. I guess maybe the question is more like, do you agree with what she did? Yeah, to each their own. Anyone else? Um, yeah, okay. So I think like forgiving, what she did is very courageous and I think she's awesome in every way that, sorry, my computer unplugged, okay. So I think she's really courageous and I think that what she did is just very admirable and forgiving someone does not mean you're gonna forget about it. Like there's no way that anyone could forget about the Holocaust. So I think forgiving someone who has hurt you in such a way, it's, it takes a very big person to do that. But that, that doesn't mean that she has, she has those scars forever, emotionally, physically, and she's not gonna be able to forget about that. So those are my two cents. Anyone else? I know like personally, I think I agree with Sophia that it's really hard to put ourselves in a situation like that. But I do think she's very brave and she's very strong for what she did. Um, and her story is still very powerful. I also agree with Eliana that like, I think sometimes people would portray her forgive it or her forgiveness as like she forgot about it but I think that you know she's always going to have that with her which is also really powerful so Definitely. Ethan do you want to ask the next question yeah one thing I really took away from the video is how like even though the, all the camps were liberated in 1945 like the health effects and the traumatic effects on the survivors really continued like throughout their lives till they died. Was there anything else that really stuck out to anyone that they really took away from this video and learned from it? I mean, I just didn't know the extent to which, <clears throat> like, I don't know very much about the twins experiments. Um, I've, I've heard about them, but I didn't know, like, obviously her story is, I mean, just, horrific of what happened to her but these different things and that like her twin sister her lived like her kidneys were still the same size whatever they had done like all these weird genetic testing and everything really messed a lot of people up unfortunately that they didn't realize until later on which is like you said Ethan like right we don't know the health effects and everything and the emotional effects post beyond it's, it's wild well it, it stuck out to me that um people who deny the Holocaust, she, she thought of how so many people deny um, the existence of gas chambers and stuff like that, um, that she thought um, to draft that document and have um, the, doc, the doctor, or what was he, he was like an operator mm -hmm. of the uh, chambers, uh, to have him sign that as like proof and as uh, a defense against um, a lot of people who denied are anti-Semites, so against anti-Semites and Holocaust deniers. Mm -hmm. And I think that leads into the next thing that we want to talk about. Um, there's been a lot of protesting, specifically in Ohio, um, some on Corona and how people are reacting to that. But um, this past week, outside of the State House in Columbus, um, there were people who were holding up signs that was a picture of a rat with a Jewish star. I think that, yeah, Rebecca's showing it. That said the real plague. Um, and so I think what's important is like, if you compare this picture to propaganda that was used by the Nazis in the Holocaust, like it's not very different. And like anti-Semitism continues to live on. So what are things that like we as teenagers can do to stand up against this and to make sure that something like the Holocaust doesn't happen? 
ever again. Um, I think that like starting like very grassroots with things like this, where we just talk about it and listen to the stories is really important because just by like bringing awareness to it and continuing to like remember it in history and stuff like that, it just is just a way to like just start the process. I think we need to like educate people like not that aren't already learning about things because there's a lot of people that like even our age that will say things because they don't know what they're talking about and so like if you hear something you need to like say oh that's not true and just tell them why and what they need to like and kind of just give them a better perspective which will help them like open their eyes and not have a, such a closed mindset. I think what would be most important for like our society as a whole is education for um, learning about anti-Semitism for Jews and non-Jews because I read like a stat last year that about 40% um, of teens in Europe don't know what the Holocaust was or how much of the effects like it had on Europe and I just think that the education of Jewish history, the Holocaust, anti-Semitism as a whole can be very effective for our world and which could help prevent any anti-Semitism in the future or at least help it like, I guess, kill off slowly. Hi, uh, I have an input. Um, I think that by keeping this Jewish community and by everyone staying together and maintaining this and strengthening this, what we have right here, temples, everything, just maintaining this Jewish community and keeping it strong and making sure it doesn't diminish, making sure the amount of Jewish people in the world doesn't drop for years to go, just keeping it up and up. I think that's one of the biggest contributing, contributing factors to how we can make sure something doesn't happen again. Along the lines of what Sophia said, how do you guys feel about the fact that Holocaust is, education isn't mandatory in the state of Ohio? Um, it, it's really terrible to see. I actually remember last year, there was a guy who specifically came up to my lunch table like the weeks leading up to Yom HaShoah and the two days of Yom HaShoah. And it was just randomly coincidental that he would like kind of like make gas chamber jokes, make Holocaust jokes, make anti-Semitic, like poking fun, whatever. And I just think that more people need to be educated on the horrors of it, the long-term effects, what happened in the camps, what happened in the marches. At least read like Eli Wiesel, at least like read Night to give some perception. I just think more people need to know just in general. I think that what's hard is like, we don't see it a ton based on where we live. Like we live in this Cleveland bubble. And so sometimes it's really, really hard to visualize that. But I also know that last year at Beachwood, there was a teacher who didn't really touch on the Holocaust when other classes did. And it was this whole like thing. That, um, so, yeah, it happens everywhere. And I think that that's maybe something that we as an ONR community can do to write letters to legislation and people who make legislation um, to push a bill that provides Holocaust education. Because if people aren't educated, then, I mean, it's almost not as much their fault as the state's fault that things like this are happening. Yeah, definitely. Education is really important. How do you guys think, like, if you saw the anti-Semitic protester on the street, how would you react to it? Like, would you talk to them? Would you just, uh, like, pass them by? Because they don't have any thoughts. Um, okay. So, personally, I don't... I've never been in that type of situation, so I don't know how I'd actually respond because I feel like I'd be very, very scared and just, I'd probably first like hide my necklace because I always have like a Jewish star necklace. That's probably the first thing I would 
automatically do is hide that just out of fear. But I don't know. In theory, I think I'd maybe try to go talk to them and be like, why are you doing this? Like, why do you feel like this is appropriate? And that it's, it's hateful. It's hurting somebody and there's no reason for it. And I'd try to have a calm conversation. Hopefully. Just out of question, Eliana, why would you have hidden your sorry out of fear? But like, what what is that fear? I'm not saying that's right or wrong because like when I was traveling, I also hid mine in certain countries because yeah. I just didn't need to have like something else come up, right? But here, like where we live, and in Columbus, if you happen to be in Columbus that day, like what would have been your reasoning for hiding that other than fear? I think just instinctively, like after the Tree of Life shooting, like I like like I was in Temple. And like synagogue on that day that it happened and I like grabbed my star of David necklace because I was just terrified so it's just kind of instinctive at that point I think I I don't know if there's an answer you don't have to answer it was just like there's an answer because I feel like it could get physical you don't know what they can do because mm -hmm. you can only control your actions you can't control theirs so if there's something that I can do to protect myself, that's not, it's just like a preemptive situation. I can relate to that. Um, my parents always tell me to hide my star before I go into public. I mean, it really sucks in the, in the long run that there are still so many people who are anti-Semitic um, nowadays um, with how the world has progressed. I mean, I look at um, one of my favorite bands, Pink Floyd, the lead singer and bassist um, is very anti-Semitic. Um, and I just think you, you look at it and it, it sucks how it is, but it's the world we live in. And, you know, I think, yeah, that's all we can do. I think that I guess I have one more question, like speaking about actions and things that we can do, what are like specific things that you guys think that we can even do this year? I mean, BBYO at February execs at IC passed a new initiative called Rise Up, which is about anti-Semitism and standing up against that. And that's something that Ethan and I really wanna to work to incorporate into o r So what are some things that you guys think we can do that are like, plausible for this year and for the continuations that we can try to leave anti-Semitism in the past. Maybe like a committee or task force for Cleveland and it could be an example for other regions if they don't already have it since I know that's a thing in other places I think we could start an ONR anti-Semitism task force or a committee or something like that. Um, just as a past convention coordinator, especially with Kala, um, when we did an anti-Semitism program, I thought that was really uh, impactful and like a, a very good thing that we did. I just think that uh, a couple, like a, a program like that at every convention should be something that's pushed, um, especially at Kala, maybe one or two of those could be one directed about the Holocaust specifically, so it could, so we could keep the education in our region going and uh, hopefully we could spread that out of our community as well. Those are both, yeah, you go. You go. That's a great point, Parker, about like raising awareness about anti-Semitism. I feel like we really need to do more of that as a region. And like, we should all be looking out for anti-Semitism in the world where we see it and just uh, being more aware of it and exposing ourselves to it is really important. Even just watching like more videos. I mean, this is very Holocaust specific, but um, we, used a whole like database to find the video that we wanted to show you guys and that's something that we can share on the Facebook after this if you guys want to hear more stories there's a ton of them um 
And I think that's also really important to just educate yourself so you can educate others. Um, does anyone have any closing statements? Okay. Um, I think that we can also learn how to like handle anti-Semitic comments and stuff like that because when we go to college, like the Cleveland bubble might just be like a bubble for right now, but when we go to college, like it's all gonna be very different and like situations may present themselves. So I think just like learning how to deal with it and like what to say, what not to say, what to do and like what not to do. Isn't there a BBY on demand um, thing going on with Halal where they're like partnering with different schools and talking about that? Yeah, I think that there's a bunch of those like coming up soon. I'm sure Alana knows more about that if you want to touch on that. They are doing a lot of stuff since college tours were canceled with each Halal. So they're like touring the Halal at a lot of the different schools and it's all up on the website for it. But there's a bunch of different task forces that are being created. So like Ellie already mentioned, the Rise Up Task Force is designed to create resources and work towards combating anti-Semitism. Um, I have a call for it on Thursday because we're working on creating enough resources to give the found like to build a foundation for the committee to actually go off of. But stuff for that's gonna be coming out soon. There's a lot of programs like Zika on Barcelona and other opportunities that BBY is presenting to all of you that you can choose to participate in if you so choose to. But like, it's a lot of preparing and making sure that we are doing everything that we can in order to, as whoever just said it, I don't remember who it was, I think Sydney just said it really well, but it's about preparing for the future. And like, you all know we live in a Cleveland bubble. Like everyone said it in here, we all know it, that like, if you walk around in the middle of Beechwood wearing like a tali, people aren't gonna look at you like you're that weird because it's just like Beechwood. But it's things that once we get out of Cleveland, you should be able to be educated enough on like Jewish issues and where people stand and like understanding the difference between like anti-Semitism versus like um, criticizing Israel and a lot of the very like where the law where the line is drawn situations and I think that that's what we're working towards creating resources and task forces for to be able to educate all of you on. Um, does anyone have anything else they would like to add? I would like to add on that note that there are a ton of other um, Jewish opportunities happening on BBY On Demand beyond just Yom HaShoah commemoration. I'm going to drop a link to a little like sheet in the chat box right now. And that includes at 9 p.m. tonight, the final um, kind of send off for this Yom HaShoah that is happening on BBY On Demand. It's going to be kind of an extension of things like this that have been happening throughout the day. Um, so if you want to check that out, it's going to be very impactful, and I hope you all do. And some of those other programs that are happening in the next few weeks are also going to be really special. Yeah. Um, so we want to thank you guys for coming. I think it's really important to participate in things like this, and especially on a day like this to talk about this. So. Um, yeah, we hope you guys have a great night and that you'll join BBY On Demand for their closing program about Yom HaShoah. Um, and if not, that you enjoyed this and got a lot from talking about this. Um, Sydney and Adam's not in here. Sydney, upcoming programs, if there's any. Yeah, hold on, let me just pull up the schedule. Um... Oh, While Sydney does that, I just want to do a big shout out to um, Ellie and Ethan for leading this program and getting it all set up. Thank you so much. It was very awesome. I think I enjoyed it, just having that conversation about anti-Semitism and like what we can do more. So thank you. Thank you. And thank you for joining us, everyone. Okay, so tomorrow is BBG's 76th anniversary. Um, Bree Sheet has a virtual game night at 6 p.m. Then Thursday, we don't have any programs, but you can go to BBY On Demand because there's lots of other programs. Oh, and there's also, I'm pretty sure, a BBG Founders Day birthday party tomorrow night on BBY On Demand. I think I've seen that somewhere. 5 p.m., um, ladies and gents, 5 p.m. 5 p.m. Um, then Friday. So um, we there's we have nothing particularly scheduled, so it's just BBY On Demand. Then 
Saturday is Exodus Green and Black Night. Am I missing? Are we doing BBG Happy Hour on Friday? Not Happy Hour, just BBG Founders Day ONR party. It, I think, Amelia, do you want to talk about that? Or, no, Amelia does not want to talk right now. Okay, it's from five to six on this Friday. It's going to be open to all ONR BBGs. And if you want to invite any of your international BBG friends, they can hop on, it'll be really fun. We're gonna be doing really cute BBG things. So yeah, I'm excited. Amelia, Amelia's excited too. I can speak for her. Amelia's very excited. And then Sunday, we don't have any programming plans. So you can just go to Be The Lion Demand and there's lots of programming there. So yeah. Amazing. Thank you all for joining us and we hope you have a great rest of your night and that you enjoyed this. Um, bye guys. Bye everyone. Thank you for joining bye. us.